Welcome to Capital Considerations, the podcast that takes complex ideas from the investment world and makes them accessible to everyone. I'm your host, Tony Roth, Chief Investment Officer of Wilmington Trust. Today's episode is entitled Coronavirus Revisited. Where are we now? Where are we headed? I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Amesh Adalja. Uh, welcome, Dr. Adalja. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so many of you know that we had Dr. Adalja on a client call about a week ago. Dr. Adalja is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins University Center for Health Security. Dr. Adalja is also a fellow with the Infectious Disease Society of America. And he actively practices medicine, and his work is focused on emerging infectious diseases, pandemic preparedness, and biosecurity. And the goal of today's call really is to update our listeners on developments over the last week. And as the title implies, to talk about where we think we're headed, given the incremental information that we've learned over the last week in terms of the progression of the, the pandemic. I think it's fair to call it that now, uh, as well as the reaction uh, to those events. And I think the place to start is probably with the mortality, although I'm dying to know, Dr. Adalja, whether I'm going to get to go on my vacation out of the country in about four or five weeks. Um, we'll have to get to that later in the conversation. One of the things that happened um, that I had to smile at earlier this week was that Facebook came out and they announced all in one release that they were both going to remove any false advertising related to the coronavirus on their uh, website. And at the same time, they were going to provide free advertising to the World Health Organization. And that was within an hour of the time that the World Health Organization had earlier in the day reported that the mortality rate was 3.4%. So it was hard not to see the irony in the, in the Facebook announcement because for those of us that are following this carefully, I think it's fair to say that what the World Health Organization seemed to do, which was include in the denominator um, only the confirmed cases in the numerator, of course, tragically are those that have passed away. And we believe that the number of cases out there is far in excess of, of the reported cases, such that the 3.4% is probably quite a bit lower. So let's start with the mortality rate today, Dr. Adalja. What is your latest thinking? We did receive today, of course, from uh, Johns Hopkins University, the news that the total number of cases is now over 100,000. Again, just confirmed cases um, worldwide. Does it seem like it's increasing or decreasing? Any, any sense of that at this stage? I do think that the mortality rate is going to likely fall as we get better at diagnostic testing. We are seeing, for example, in South Korea, where they've done extensive testing, the mortality rate be below 1% at around 0.6%. So that may be closer to the true uh, case fatality ratio that we have with this virus. And that 3.6%, like you said earlier, is a skewed number because of the severity bias and the data primarily from China where only confirmed cases, which are really reflective of what the testing protocols are, uh, kind of driving that that uh, case fatality rate. And as we get increased testing, I think you'll see the case fatality ratio drop uh, to definitely below 1%. I can't say exactly where I think it's going to end up, but I know it'll probably be below 1%. And maybe South Korea is a good uh, ballpark figure uh, for now. So thank you. There's reasons to think that there may be some variability in the mortality rate from place to place around the world. And we did touch on that last week when we noted, for example, uh, various respiratory conditions in China due to the, the poor air quality and the high incidence of smokers, et cetera, compared to other areas of the, of the world, as well as, of course, the difference in quality of medical care. But um, one of the things that I was particularly interested to ask you is that there has been some report of perhaps what I would call a mutation in the virus. And data that suggested 70% of, the, of those infected globally have one strain and 30% have another strain. And I haven't seen a lot of follow-up on that particular line of thinking. And I'm wondering if you, if you saw any of that and what your thoughts are around that. And what is the significance to the extent that there is anything valid in there around the idea that there may be these two strains, one being more virulent than the other? And could that have, be having an impact on why we may see some of the variation in mortality rates from place to place? You have to remember that all viruses have evolutionary changes that occur to them. And you can have multiple lineages in an outbreak starting to develop. And it's not surprising to me that you can see more than one lineage. But that doesn't necessarily mean that one is causing more disease, than, worse disease than the other. I think this is still early days, and all of this really has to be vetted and really analyzed in a 
in a very rigorous manner before you can make claims that one strain is more virulent than the other strain. So I think it's something to watch for uh, and look at. And it's not something to be surprised about to see a virus evolving as it moves from person to person. But I don't think there's any strong or convincing evidence yet that we've got one more virulent strain than the other. And uh, I think it's it, there's a lot of information out there, and it's going to take some time to sift through it all. But for right now, I think we've got to deal with the virus as such and uh, and really try and uh, understand what's driving mortality. And I think that's really going to cluster around the patient's age and the comorbidities that the patients have. So let's pivot then to talk about some of the things that are happening here in the United States. One of the, um, I think, challenges that we're facing is that relative to other countries around the world, while our preparedness may be quite high from sort of an institutional healthcare standpoint, in terms of the various tools that we have to treat patients that are ill, our preparedness certainly wasn't where one would have hoped it to be from a diagnostic or testing standpoint. Just today, for example, New York City released some information that it had sent um, a communication to the, to, the, to the CDC, I think, that they felt that their ability to combat the virus was significantly hampered because they, they, even today they continue to lack adequate testing. People talked about a million tests by the end of this week. Do you feel like we're, we're starting to correct that problem? Is it getting ramped up a little bit more quickly now? Or do you think that it's still a lot of smoke and mirrors and we really don't have a decent uh, testing capacity today or won't for a while? It's definitely been ramped up. I think this has been a subject of great public debate how fractured this whole approach to testing was with really the CDC being the primary source of testing for quite a long time and only now the state health labs coming online. I do think that the problems have been fixed from a regulatory standpoint, but it is going to take some time to scale up testing at commercial labs, at hospital labs, and even longer for the test kits that are available in doctor's offices or in hospitals to be made. So I do think we're going to see more and more tests be issued every day, but I think that it's going to be probably weeks before we get to the testing capacity that we actually need. So my next question is, I think it's one that doesn't have a certain answer perhaps, but and it's, I think it's going to be one of the tougher questions for you today because it really relates to sort of what we should expect of one another as sort of you know, co-partners in our society as we all together go through this process of, of living through this, this, this horrible um, pandemic. I've talked to a number of people that are concerned that they may be ill, they have a cough, um, they may have a fever, but they're not in a cohort or a group that have those, I think you use the word comorbidities or those characteristics that would put them in a high risk category at all, nor do they feel like they're overly ill. And they don't feel necessarily the need to go rush and, and test themselves. And in fact, some of them are even thinking about, well, maybe I go to work, maybe I don't go to work. I can't really tell how severe this is. But a lot of them are suggesting, well, maybe I should get myself tested because it would cause myself to quarantine myself. But that actually requires that they use one or more tests that could have gone to somebody else. How, how would you advise people that, you know, maybe on the younger side or, you know, very healthy individuals that may, may have some fairly mild symptoms, should everybody be running out to get these tests right away? Or should people be sort of waiting to see if it really progresses to something more significant, knowing that in most cases it won't, but they could also leave them in a position where they are infectious and, and they, could, they could spread it? I don't think that every person needs to go out and get a test. And I do think that we need to, at least until testing is available everywhere, basically try and decide who the, the best candidates are for the test. Because many people are going to have mild illnesses and get better. And I think it is important to test some mild cases so that we can get some understanding of what's going on. And that might be done through surveillance projects using flu surveillance networks. So I think that if you are someone that's otherwise healthy and you have mild symptoms, I think you it's, it's a fair thing to assume that maybe your illness could be the coronavirus. And despite whatever it is, if it's the coronavirus or if it's influenza or some other virus, you probably should not be contacting, uh, be in contact with other people. That's something we should do normally. It's just that we're not very good at doing it, but the coronavirus has heightened people's uh, idea of what we should do normally. So during flu season, if you have the flu, you shouldn't be out around people. But people just ignore that. But because they're more nervous about the coronavirus, they're much more likely to self-isolate. So I think that if you have those symptoms and you're, you're somebody that has a fairly mild predicted, predicted clinical course, you can probably refrain from testing for the most part. And 
and the tests should really be used until we get enough of them on patients that are hospitalized, needing medical care, and as part of surveillance networks to, to see exactly what's going on in community spread. Because there's going to come a time, because we're in the middle of a pandemic with no population immunity, that most of the respiratory illnesses in a community are going to be caused by this. Just like in the height of flu season, most of the respiratory illnesses are caused by influenza, and we sometimes forego testing and actively treat, treat people as, have they, as if they have influenza, despite not having a confirmatory test done. So let me ask you a bit more about that. You said that it will get to a point where most of these respiratory illnesses could be likely or would be, would be likely to be corona as opposed to flu. Why would that be the case? In other words, wouldn't the flu be also continue to be a very good candidate for anybody that has a set of respiratory illnesses so, such that you'd have to test and figure out, is it corona or is it the flu? Because it could be a very different protocol for how to treat those things. What I think will happen is right now, the flu season is winding down. The number of positive test results for flu is going down. If we continue to see high respiratory illnesses and flu is going down, and we are testing for flu anyway all the time, people are doing flu surveillance, but we still have this high burden of respiratory illness, I think you can make an assumption that something is taking the place of flu. And if that's the case, this coronavirus is likely to be the best candidate. Obviously, if you're in the middle of both flu season and both coronavirus uh, season, so that might be next year, you're going to have to do tests to distinguish. And I think that will be hopefully much easier to do by that time because we'll have that capacity. Commercial labs will have added this novel coronavirus onto their respiratory viral panels. But I do think in the next couple of weeks, in the next couple of months, if we continue to see coronavirus community transmission in the United States, many of the respiratory viruses that people experience, because it is the tail end of flu and flu season seems to be winding down according to the CDC data, will be from this coronavirus. There obviously are going to be others there as well. There's other viruses that can cause upper respiratory infections. But I do think because this is new and there's no population immunity uh, and we know that it's spreading, we'll be able to get a gauge on that. And hopefully local health departments will be doing surveillance so you have something more to inform it, knowing that, yes, this is here. We've tested, randomly sampled this many people and they all had coronavirus. So we know that this is in the community. And that's something that happens every year with flu season. There comes a point where the test isn't as useful anymore because we know that this case is consistent with flu and we prescribe those people flu antivirals uh, anyway without a test because the test doesn't add as much predictive value because you, the clinical score is good enough. Thank you for clarifying that. And that, that very naturally leads me to another question, which is this key question that a lot of people keep on wrestling with. And I asked you about it last week, which is this notion that just as many of the prior coronaviruses um, and I may not be referring to them perfectly here, but whether it be H1N1 or MERS or SARS or the influenza that we have annually um, or even the common cold, they are indeed have been seasonal. Um, and there's been a real hope, I think, put on the idea that the coronavirus is going to turn out to be seasonal as well. When you look at the pattern of what you're seeing around the world, so for example, Iran is not a place that you think of a lot of snow, you know, even though it's in the Northern Hemisphere. Australia, of course, it's the summer down there, late summer down there, and, and they've had some communities transmission in Australia. Is there anything further that you can infer at this point around whether or not the corona could have a seasonal cycle to it? Sure. So we do know that coronaviruses, the four seasonal ones, have a seasonality to them, that they peak in the winter and spring and then taper off in summer. When I say that they taper off, that doesn't mean that they completely disappear. It means that their transmission is less, that there are less cases, that their prevalence in the community goes down. So that's what we find in temperate climates. It's not the same in tropical climates where respiratory viruses tend to have no seasonality, and obviously the northern and southern hemisphere have op opposite seasons. So it's not going to be completely... Uh, ironclad that all of a sudden one day the, the virus just disappears. It just may have decreased transmission and it might give us a respite during the summer, just like H1N1 uh, did in the summer of 2009. This is not completely, uh, the, you know, a proven type of thing, but it's something that we're hoping to see and trying to extrapolate from other coronaviruses. But it may be a little different because we don't have population immunity to this coronavirus, so we may not see that same dynamic occur, but it is something that we're watching for. But still a little too early to draw any conclusions, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah to draw any conclusive con conclusions. I think it's something that's suggestive, and it may happen, but I don't want to say that this is going to for sure happen because uh, this is a novel coronavirus, and there's not population immunity to it, so it may have the capacity to, to kind of overcome environmental conditions that make other coronavirus spreads 
less uh, less conducive. And I do think it's important to test the flu negative patients. The people who get tested for flu and their swabs are negative, you should test them for this coronavirus. I think at least it's part of a research project and some cases have already been detected that way. So for example, the teenager in Washington state that was diagnosed, it was it was part of a flu surveillance project where his flu test was negative, so they tested him for the coronavirus. And I think that increasingly should be a paradigm that we use at least in research and maybe even in clinical care that we we test patients for the flu virus, and if the flu virus is negative, move on to that coronavirus, and hopefully eventually have combined panels that can test for the flu and other respiratory virus as well as a novel coronavirus. Right. It makes very logically that most people would have one or the other if they have that set of symptoms, um, given the choices today. Okay, so let's pivot to uh, the, the next topic, which is what can we expect to happen over the coming months here in the United States in terms of our lives, how we live our lives, and the kinds of limitations whether they be self-imposed or government-imposed, that we may come up against. So when you think about the number of cases that we have, I think a week ago we were maybe a dozen cases. I think today we're uh, in the 250 or so cases. These are, of course, just the reported cases. Um, We know that there are many, many more cases, some multiple of that, that haven't been uh, detected. So perhaps in a week we'll be 3,000 cases or or more just in the U.S. So when you think about that geometric pattern uh, and the reaction to that in what I think can be somewhat of a emotional society that we live in, to say it nicely, one can imagine pretty quickly a scenario where, you know, March Madness is played in empty stadiums. I think that actually there's a Division Three game happening at Johns Hopkins this weekend, which is going to be played in an empty state, in an empty, um, it's not really a stadium, but in a gymnasium. How bad do you see it getting in the next few weeks to a month or so in terms of the disruption that this is going to cause to the the kind of freedoms and patterns that we're used to enjoying in our in our lives. I think as more testing comes online, you're going to see more positive cases all over the country. You're going to see community spread be established in multiple locations in the United States. And the disruption the disruptive aspect of this is going to get worse before it gets better because you're going to find local governments, local health departments and local politicians basically calling for certain types of actions that may or may not be justified, and that's going to be disruptive to people's lives because you might have schools closed, you might have uh, you might have telecommuting policies at work, you might have events canceled, and there's going to be a lot of that that happens until people start to realize that this is a community spreading virus, and some of that stuff may not necessarily be as impactful as you think it might be because it is already out there. And then hopefully people will shift back to a paradigm that we saw during the 2009 influenza pandemic where most people cope with this. It was disruptive. It was very difficult for healthcare systems to deal with, but it was something that people got through and and could continue their activities of daily living. And I think that's going to take some time to pivot to that. So let me make sure I, I sort of, there's a balance, right? Because on the one hand, by being too disruptive, we are really impeding uh, the society and the ability for people to, to lead, lead productive and happy lives. On the other hand, apart from the fact that there's an underlying sort of direct goal of trying to protect people by quarantining them, there's also what I would describe as a very critical second order goal of limiting activity, which is buying us time. Whether it be buying us time until you get the natural seasonal decline, if that's in, in fact what's going to happen, or whether it's buying us time towards possibly a therapeutic or possibly um, a, va- a vaccination. What's your judgment of, of what the right balance is? Given the fact that it's a community spreading virus, what, what do you think the right, what would you suggest? What do you think the right balance is? Is it, of course, you want to stay away from high risk populations like people in nursing homes, but other than that, people should go about their lives and just wash their hands well and et cetera, et cetera? Or should we be closing down schools I mean, what, what's the right balance in your estimation? There's not going to be a one-size-fits-all type of answer to this. It really has to depend upon what's going on in the actual community where you're thinking about closing a school or canceling a meeting or, or changing the way people go about their daily life. It's, it's not something that you can dictate kind of from, uh, from up high. You really have to look at the actual transmission dynamics in a community. And there is, a, there is some data with influenza that, for example, closing schools might flatten the curve, meaning you don't get a big peak right away, that it kind of spreads out over time, and that can, that can be valuable. But that's not necessarily the case with the coronavirus because we don't know what the role of schools are. We don't know what the role of kids are in transmitting coronavirus. And you have all these other, uh, other factors. Suppose you close a school. Where will the children go then? 
Are they going to go to the park and play together? And then that defeats the purpose. Are they going to be able to be to get their meals? Because some children rely on the school for their breakfast and their lunch. Who's going to take care of those children? Are they going to have to take their parents going to have to come out of work to take care of them? And now that's going to be more disruptive. How long are you going to close schools for? When you, what's your threshold for opening them? And if you wait too long to close schools and there's already community spread, you're not really going to get any impact from it. So I think it's not, these aren't easy decisions to make. And although it might seem like a, a local politician or, or a school board might just make these decisions kind of, uh, as knee jerks, they're, they're not, they shouldn't be made that way. They, they really are a nuanced decision that takes a lot into account. Any of these types of social distancing measures need to be thought about and think in, in the context of what's going on in that community. And certainly there are certain, st- social distancing measures that people should take, such as if you are sickly, if you are frail, if you're elderly, if other medical conditions, you probably should think about what you do when you go out in public and maybe try to minimize that and maybe not travel as much on public transportation. But we tell people to do that during flu season too. They just don't do it. The other issue is is that a lot of the stuff that we're recommending are stuff that we should be doing every flu season but don't. So we should really issue to everybody a double yardstick and they should walk around and extend it and make sure that no one comes within that radius, right? <laughs> okay, so um, what do you think is likely to happen with, I think that last week I used the metaphor of the, the, uh, the fishbowl turned inside out. And so, of course, China seems to have gotten ahead of the situation to some degree. Now, they've imposed, I think, changes to their society, which are we might think of as draconian or pretty severe. And, of course, we don't know the reliability of their data. Nonetheless, it does seem to a large degree, even anecdotally, when we talk to people that they're maybe over the hump to the extent that they continue to impose these kind of measures. We in the United States and most countries in the world have cut off travel from China to, to our, our domestic areas. Can you see that reversing itself? In other words, we were having a conversation here in the office. One of my colleagues is headed, hopefully, to Costa Rica for spring break in the first week of April. I'm supposed to be going to Ecuador to, as a jumping off place to go to the Galapagos. And do you think that a lot of these countries, you know, in four weeks may have shut off the U.S. as a source of tourism and so on and so forth due to what could look like a pretty bad situation here domestically relative to some of these other countries that are either in the Southern Hemisphere or have been spared so far the kind of community spread that we've seen? I do think that that's a real possibility, that it's very logistically difficult to... to navigate international travel right now. And although travel bans and restrictions are not something the WHO recommends and they actually actively argue against, these are going to happen. They're happening now. And I do think if you're from one country that has a lot of spread, you're going to see very restrictive actions taken against you in many countries of the world because they don't follow those guidelines because it seems so easy for them to close borders and to restrict travel. So I would really worry about that if I were traveling internationally. I traveled internationally about two weeks ago, and I I was a little bit worried that something weird would happen, uh, but I think it's only going to increase over time because... We're already hearing about travel bans from one part of what from one country to another or border closures are still going on, even though these are not recommended. And I think it's only going to increase for a while until people change and pivot and realize that this is going to be a non-containable virus. And it's taking a long time. Even the WHO isn't saying that yet, even though everyone really knows that that's the case. And it's unclear how much China's China's efforts actually worked. I think that the WHO has written this glowing report, but some people have questioned what actually what they saw, what was there, how how much they were handled by the Chinese. And I think this is a real open question because the Chinese aren't testing mild cases. We know that because of their case fatality ratio. So how much do we know about how uh, the handle they have on this virus? And clearly their overreaction, despite whether or not it worked, has set an example for the world. And the WHO is basically telling other countries to follow that example. And I think that's really going to add to the disruption. And it may not have any any benefit because it really is premised on this idea that this virus can be contained. And and we know that this isn't something that's been contained and had been spreading in, in China for weeks before it was actually noticed. Giving a, a virus that spread so efficiently such a head start really argues against any kind of containment methodology, we really need to think about mitigation and stop with this this containment. Uh, and people say that's a surrender, and I don't think it's a surrender. I think it really reflects the reality that this containment wasn't going to work on a virus of this character. Okay, got it. So let me pivot to the last area of questions, which are the, I think, most practical ones where we have a lot of the listeners looking for more clarity 
on their daily routines, the things that they should probably be, be staying away from or things that seem like they're okay. So interestingly, one of the questions that I had uh, repeated to me most often is, is it okay for me to go to the gym and work out? Because it seems like no matter how clean the gym, you know, putatively is, gyms are inherently messy places, but whether it be a gym or anything else, is, is there anything that stands out to you that would be advice that you would um, suggest that those of us that do live in communities where there's already been incidents of community spread. And so, and the other question is that I've had a lot of people ask is just for further clarification on how long the virus can live on a surface. So the first question um, regarding going to the gym, I think it's fine to go to the gym. I think you have to be careful though and wash your hands a lot and touch your face less. If you're somebody that's elderly or has medical conditions, you may want to avoid public contact, uh, especially if there's community spread in your in your area. And I would advise people to, to think about uh, exercising at home if, if they are somebody that's prone to uh, having a severe case based on their risk factors. But for most people, I think they, they should go to the gym if they want to go to the gym and just be cognizant of the fact that you need to wash your hands and and, uh, and not touch your face. And if you are sick, you probably shouldn't be going to the gym. But that's, again, something that we would say during flu season, not specific to this coronavirus. When you look at lab studies for how long the coronavirus lives on a surface, it's important to remember that those are lab studies with special characteristics trying to show how long they can actually s keep this virus viable. So there's certain humidity conditions, certain UV radiation conditions, certain temperatures that are not necessarily replicable in everyday life. But there is the, the, the idea that this virus can remain viable on surfaces probably for hours to maybe a day in most conditions. And that's why we encourage people to wash their hands a lot, especially when they're touching common touch surfaces. But if you look at the outbreak as a whole, the real thrust of this transmission is from respiratory droplets coming from coughs and sneezes, not from people touching things, although there are going to be some cases that are related to touching things. And I think that's important to keep in mind. And remember, this is not a very hardy virus. It can be killed by all the household the detergents and, and products that you have. It's nothing special about this. So the same type of stuff you do use during cold and flu season will work against this on your countertops and surfaces. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Dalsha. I'm going to pivot now and just talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the economy and what we're seeing in the markets. So what we are seeing in the economy is, on the one hand, uh, just this morning, we had a fabulous jobs report that suggests that the economy in the month of February continued to hold up extremely well almost really a record jobs report, 270,000 or so new private payrolls created during an economic cycle that were really pretty late. And we're starting with a very low unemployment rate already. Um, and it's a, it's a jobs report that ordinarily would be accompanied with probably a very hearty rally in the stock market, particularly when we don't have an inflation problem, uh, which is clearly the situation today. Nonetheless, markets sold off pretty hev heavily today. When we look at what's happening, not in terms of the low-frequency data like a jobs report, but the more high-frequency data, like, for example, jobless claims, which let yesterday on Thursday moved up above 250,000 for the week, which is a very large number. I mean, look at things like, notwithstanding the fact that mortgage rates are all-time lows, we're actually seeing lower U.S. mortgage activity. We're seeing various signs that consumer strength is starting to wane. We're seeing um, a collapse in small business confidence where the most re recent reading on that is below 100. We think that as well, there's an, an underlying uh, po um, political risk, which is weighing on the economy, which is the, Bi the resurgence of Joe Biden has, on the one hand, seemed to create some level of, of reassurance that we're not going to have the Bernie Sanders outcome, which the, the economy certainly would not wish to see, but that we are possibly going to have a Democrat in the White House, because if Biden does win the nomination, if he's able to keep up his momentum, then we're likely to see a pretty tough battle, I think, for the president in November, um, particularly if the coronavirus is perceived to have not been handled optimally, or if um, we, we end up getting a recession. And so that likelihood of President Trump being reelected is also really starting to dip now. And all of those things together are suggesting that when we think about where this is likely to go in the various permutations that we've just spent a lot of time discussing, uh, Dr. Adalja, that there is probably at least a 50% chance now of an economic contraction in the, the second, uh, excuse me, in the second quarter um, for 2020. Now, usually when we talk about a recession, a recession is two consecutive quarters of economic contraction. We're not quite ready to say that's going to happen, um, but we are ready to say that there is now at least a 50%, if not greater chance of economic contraction here in the U.S. in the second quarter. 
And there's almost certainly economic contraction happening in Japan and in Europe, not just in Germany, but Europe broadly now, due to the impact of the coronavirus on top of what had already been a fairly weak economic situation. Now, when we pivot to look at the markets and we look at some of the key things in the markets, we see that um, the spread between two-year rates and 10-year rates has widened out actually to around 22 basis points. Now, that's typically a positive sign for the economy and a bullish sign when the, the difference between short-term rates and long-term rates increases in that way. But here, we're not so convinced because when you have the long end of the curve increasing and the short end of the curve uh, staying steady, that's typically the scenario where the markets are seeing greater potential for growth and inflation, um, which would push long rates up, and that's bullish for the economy. Here, instead, what we're seeing is a real collapse in short-term rates due to the expectations that the Federal Reserve will continue to lower rates. And in fact, the long-term bond, even though it hasn't dropped as quickly as the short-term bond, has seen um, numbers that are really startlingly low. It's no longer the case that you need to go to Europe, in fact, if you want to have uh, enjoy lower, lo, lo, very low interest rates. Here, we had 65 basis point tenure um, within the last 24 hours. And as of right now, the tenure is trading around 73 basis points. So... Overall, I think the, mar the markets are sending a, a very bearish signal from the fixed income side. And then on the equity side, we're seeing that um, we're down around 14% from the all-time highs. The worst that we had seen in the last week was about 16% down. So we're almost at the lows for the correction that we're uh, experiencing here domestically in the U.S. Uh, and unless we see some type of very surprising stand back of the virus, diminution of the, the uh, community spread that we're seeing. It's our assessment that uh, we certainly haven't seen lows yet from th this event and that we're going to be down um, a good 20%, if not even a little bit more um, by the time it's all over from, from the highs. We can also see that, um, interestingly, and by contrast, in China, their domestic market troughed at around down 10%. And because even though they were late in recognizing the, the virus and reacting to it, I think in a transparent way, because the measures they took from a containment standpoint were so draconian and because they're now sending their workers back to work, which may turn out to be the wrong thing to do, but at least for right now, um, it's signaling to the world they're getting back on their feet. They were only down about 2.5 to 2.6% um, from their all-time highs in, in terms of the Shanghai composite. So putting it all together, when we think about how we're positioned, we continue to be, we moved um, last week on Monday to an underweight position on risky assets from an overweight. So we had been a couple percent overweight, now we're about a percent underweight. And as well, um, we're positioned with managers that tend to be defensive. Um, and we're very pleased to see that the large majority of our managers are indeed outperforming as markets fall um, with the defens defensive positions that they have across their portfolios. So while of course, we're not happy with the absolute returns that any markets are showing these days, or at least equity markets. The, the overall returns from a relative perspective are quite solid for us. And we expect to see more of the same until we get to a point where Dr. Adalja has talked about, you know, either we have a broader immunity within the population, which would allow this to start to diminish, or we get to a vaccination or a therapeutic or something of that nature. Before I close, I did want to ask you, Dr. Adalja, our clients are interested to know, um, we did talk about the rem remdesivir, if I'm saying it correctly, um, medication last week, and we were waiting to see whether or not the clinical study in, in China might return any positive information, whether it's official or even any unofficial information that you may hear through the health channels. Wondering if you've heard anything around those lines that might suggest uh, something positive possibly. I haven't personally seen any results yet. Uh, I think everybody's anxiously anticipating the phase two clinical trial data. We do know that this is ongoing and that patients are receiving the drug. So we're very hopeful, but uh, we haven't seen any data yet to show uh, its efficacy. And nothing else in, in along those lines from a therapeutic standpoint other than that particular drug that's actually in clinical trials yet? Well, there are multiple things that are kind of being trialed. So we have... A HIV medications that are being put into clinical trials in China. There are many traditional Chinese medicines that are in clinical trials in China. There is an anti-malarial drug that shows some promise that's already actually FDA approved called chloroquine that people are thinking about using. Uh, there are people using convalescent plasma. That's the blood of recovered individuals on, on patients. There are people trying to use other 
antibody-based treatments as well. So there are a lot of clinical trials going on, but I think remdesivir is probably the farthest along. And I would also just have people's attention to chloroquine, which is an interesting anti-malarial that has pretty good activity against coronaviruses. But remember, that's a, a generic drug that's widely available, so it's a little bit different uh, in terms of how we might uh, approach that drug versus remdesivir, which is not approved for anything right now. Is that in clinical trial as a therapeutic, or is that something that physicians could prescribe as an, as an off-label, if you will, for individual patients, but no one's really conducting any controlled studies? Both. And then last question before I wrap things up is any further thoughts on the development of a vaccine? I did read again about this Israeli vaccine that they're trying to rush to market. Any more um, either optimism or just more information generally around the activity you're seeing uh, in terms of the rush to create a vaccine for this? This is basically record speed, and record speed for a vaccine doesn't mean that you're going to have a vaccine in a couple of months. We're still looking at 12 to 18 months, even though we've got things in, in going into clinical trials at, at a very fast pace, and there's multiple different candidates, and uh, the Israeli repurposing of uh, an animal coronavirus vaccine is an interesting thing to watch because that may be some, that may be a, uh, another player that's not on people's radars and it may end up being something that's that's worthwhile. So I would uh, keep an eye on all the vaccine candidates and the more that we have, the better, the better it is that one of them will actually make it to market. And remember, it's going to take a lot of manufacturing capacity to be able to vaccinate the world. Okay, thank you so much. So let me just summarize what I think some of the key takeaways are today and I'm going to focus on three of them. One is that I think that we have a, I'm going to call it a bit of a long slog ahead of us this year in terms of dealing with this at the community level as we continue to see cases around us and as we continue to adjust to varying restrictions, whether they be self-imposed or, or governmentally imposed on us. As Dr. Adalja explained to us, we're going to see different approaches taken in different places until we get to a place of equilibrium in some sense uh, around an understanding of what the risks are associated with the virus and what the benefits are of these restrictive activities activities, but it is pretty much um, the genie's out of the bottle here and it's going to be around and spread across communities globally. The other thing though I would say along with that point is that it, it does have, it does seem like the mortality risk is going to come in at below 1%. And so if you're not a person that is in a higher risk cohort of the population, perhaps you know going on and living your life with those common sense precautions is the best thing for most people. Secondly is that we do think that there is a real chance of a contraction of economic activity here in the U.S. There's a high likelihood of a contraction of economic economic activity for the second quarter in Japan and in Europe. Assuming those things happen, we'll have to see whether or not this bleeds into the third quarter. And a lot of that is going to depend on whether or not the virus has this seasonal aspect to it and whether or not it comes back in the fall with the, with the resurgence. So that that is something that we'll just have to see. And then lastly, from an investing standpoint and a market standpoint, we're, we're not at the lows. There's still going to be more disruption to markets, almost certainly, we believe. But having said that, purely not from a political standpoint, but purely from an economic and market standpoint, to the extent that sort of the worst outcome for the fall from an economic standpoint, which would be um, more of a progressive socialist approach from the far left, is taken out of the equation. And it's certainly not ha happened yet, but it's you know, we're certainly more optimistic about it than we might have been a week ago. If Biden continues on this resurgence, then we can we can see as a base case scenario that we are going to get ahead of the curve eventually on the coronavirus through a combination of community immunity and vaccination, therapeutic, et cetera. And whether it be Trump or whether it be Biden, we would have a, an economic approach for the foreseeable future, which we believe, even in the case of Biden, would be far more conventional and would be something that we could continue to see an economic expansion, notwithstanding that we could have a, a, a technical recession over this year due to the virus. And so that, that makes us feel positive and, and reassured in terms of the fact that we have a drawdown in the markets, but we would expect the markets to come back over the following 12 months. And the right thing to do for investors is to hang in there and to wade through it rather than try to time the markets, which is always extremely risky. So with that, I want to thank you again, Dr. Adalja, so much for being here and providing us such a clear and insightful update on the corona situation. Thanks for having me. I want to thank our listeners for joining us, and I encourage you to visit WilmingtonTrust.com for a roundup of our investment and planning content. You can subscribe to Capital Considerations on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast channel. 
to ensure you get updates on future episodes. Thank you again for listening. This podcast is for information purposes only and is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the sale of any financial product or service or recommendation or determination that any investment strategy is suitable for a specific investor. Investors should seek financial advice regarding the suitability of any investment strategy based on the investor's objectives, financial situation, and particular needs. The information on Wilmington Trust's capital considerations with Tony Roth has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but its accuracy and completeness are not guaranteed. The opinions, estimates, and projections constitute the judgment of Wilmington Trust as of the date of this podcast and are subject to change without notice. Wilmington Trust is not authorized to and does not provide legal or tax advice. Our advice and recommendations provided to you is illustrative only and subject to the opinions and advice of your own attorney, tax advisor, or other professional advisor. Diversification does not ensure a profit or guarantee against a loss. There is no assurance that any investment strategy will be successful. Past performance cannot guarantee future results. Investing involves a risk and you may incur a profit or a loss. Any reference to company names mentioned in the podcast should not be constructed as investment advice or investment recommendations of those companies. Facts and views presented in this report have not been reviewed by and may not reflect information known to professionals in other business areas of Wilmington Trust or M&T Bank and may provide to seek to provide financial services to entities referred to in this report. M&T Bank and Wilmington Trust have established information barriers between their various business groups. As a result, M&T Bank and Wilmington Trust do not disclose certain client relationships or compensation received from such entities in their reports. Investment products are not insured by the FDIC or any other governmental agency, are not deposits of or other obligations of or guaranteed by Wilmington Trust, m and Bank, or any other bank or entity, and are subject to risk, including a possible loss of the principal amount invested. Wilmington Trust is a registered service mark used in connection with various fiduciary and non-fiduciary services offered by certain subsidiaries of m and Bank Corporation, including, but not limited to, Manufacturers and Traders Trust Company, m and Bank, Wilmington Trust Company, WTC, operating in Delaware only, Wilmington Trust NA, WTNA, Wilmington Trust Investment Advisors, Inc., WTIA, Wilmington Funds Management Corporation, WFMC, and Wilmington Trust Investment Management, LLC, WTIM. Such services include trustee, custodial agency, investment management, and other services. International corporate and institutional services are offered through m Bank Corporation's international subsidiaries. Loans, credit cards, retail and business deposits, and other business and personal banking services and products are offered by m Bank, member FDIC. 2021 m Bank Corporation and its subsidiaries, all rights reserved. <laughs>